Ramesses the second we're not the only ones fascinated with him i mean he no. was yeah his legacy was hugely powerful yeah so so later kings name themselves after him he's worshipped as a as a god um there's a whole priesthood operating into the ptolemaic period really? so a thousand years after his death that's pretty impressive which is pretty impressive king of kings is actually a divine title of ramses the second heka in hekau ruler of rulers wow. so it's a funny historical echo of the greatness of Ramesses. Dr. Campbell Price, good to have you back on the show. Hi, Dan Snow. Nice to be back. It's nice to be in a little studio with you. This is yeah. fun. Are we talking today? So Ramesses the Great. Let's play the silly pub game first. Is he the greatest of the Egyptian pharaohs? And how do we define that? Yeah, how do you define it? I mean, as you know, uh, Dan, I'm a big fan of Queen Hatshepsut, yeah. female pharaoh. Uh, I think she did lots um, that maybe Ramesses II benefited from. But okay. he's only number two out of 11 kings called Ramesses, and he's definitely the greatest of those. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, good answer. So in- interesting point, though, about Hatshepsut, because the she's in the 18th dynasty mm-hmm. so where are we 1300 bc y- yeah yeah the 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 late 1200s late. Uh, bc so you're talking At- 250 years after hatshepsut oh okay but but she has she and her stepson and others have have left a really powerful legacy yes basically they've um pushed uh the the area the sphere of influence i won't say the egyptian empire mm. because that's an anachronism to talk about an empire uh, for pharaonic Egypt, but they have established that set of uh, international relations that Ramesses can use to push his own agenda. We should. So this is all New Kingdom Egypt, and we should just kind of clarify because we're saying, oh, it's a few hundred years. Like, the British Empire lasted <laughs> about two hundred and fifty years, right? So, yeah. So. The New Kingdom is a remarkable period of stability. No doubt you'll mm-hmm. tell me there were moments and re- revolutions and the old sacking here and there, but mm-hmm. you're, you're talking about hundreds of years of pretty continuous, stable, pharaonic rule of of the Nile Valley, the area around it. I mean, that's a huge yeah, achievement, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, relatively stable by the ancient Egyptians' own accounts, okay. the official accounts. But you're right. I mean, the New Kingdom starts maybe 15 50 and ends about 1050 so you're you're talking about 500 years. years of pretty ambitious it's pretty ambitious uh statecraft yeah and yeah. there is no state on earth at the moment okay listeners there's no state on earth at the moment which has enjoyed a continuous kind of constitutional um, existence for 500 years at the moment, for example, in our world. I, I think it's fair to say. Yes, that's, so, that's fair to so, say, yeah. So the, the New Kingdom is pretty astonishing. He's coming in, so he's coming in, what, th- three, four hundred years into that story, mm-hmm. is he? Okay. Yes. So, yeah, the late 1200s um, BCE. So already the ancient Egyptian state, if we want to call it that, is is well over almost 2,000 yeah, years crazy. old. Going all the way back to the beginning. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, no, it's it's mad. And his dad was he inherited or? Yes, yeah, so his granddad, uh, Ramses the first, is a non-royal person brought into. Right. Uh, he has the role of 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 pharaoh thrust upon him <laughs> by a military um, colleague called Horemheb, who, who doesn't who have was children. Tutankhamun's general. Yes, exactly. Because so, things get a bit loose. Tutankhamun, uh, I, Horemheb, they're, they're casting about for pharaohs from yes. outside the royal family. Okay, yeah. And that's a fairly restricted amount of time. So for, Ram- uh, for Ramesses the boy, he would have oh, a memory really? of the Amarna period, this wow. real upheaval okay. of Tutankhamun's father wow. doing weird things. He wouldn't have lived through it, but he would... People have, would have talked. People about would have talked about it. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a couple of quite quick, quite quick pharaohs. Mm-hmm. Ramesses comes new dynasty, but but a, but a, but a reasonable continuation. It's not a sort of upheaval and new dynasty. N- no, I think that as far as you know, the sources allow us to to say, it seems quite smooth. So you have Ramesses the first, who doesn't last long, a couple of years. Seti the first. Seti the first is the is the crazy but Seti two. Beautiful, yeah, big, tomb. beautifully decorated. Yeah. I think of all the kings we know of from the 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 New Kingdom, Seti the first probably has the best taste. 
Mm. And it's funny because his son, Ramses II, pretty quickly sheds that oh, okay. <laughs> that 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 taste and and does things a bit more slapdash. So so Ramesses is one of these kings who has grown up in a successful, powerful, enduring political system. It would his, his, he doesn't feel he's looking over his shoulder, he's not worried about the dynasty, is he he's, or is does it he feels he's born to he's born to the purple. He's born to the purple in a sense, yes, because his grandfather had that that role, but maybe Ramesses the second was alive in a time before his grandfather okay. had been appointed. So he... And it's it's interesting, those kings, Seti the First in particular, are at pains to stress right. that they are legitimate, acceptable inheritors of this okay. great pharaonic history. So it's no coincidence that our two, in fact our three most significant kings lists come from the time of Seti That's the First. And Ramses the second. So that's the hey everyone. These are the list of kings stretching back to ancient yeah. times. And, and here I am here worshiping yep, them. On it. And yep. there's a wonderful fun fact, Dan, in the temple of Seti the first at Abydos, this beautiful, beautiful temple um, in 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 um, the north of southern Egypt. You have this corridor completely decorated, uh, you know, six seven meters long with royal names. And it shows Seti the first and his son, the crown prince uh, Ramesses worshipping the names as if reading the names out. And the location of the corridor is between the abattoir of the temple and the centre of the cult activity. So all the, you know, beef dinners that had to be brought to the statues of the gods had to pass by the names of the ancestors. So it's almost like guaranteeing they will be given a supply of offerings. Right. And that is a lovely little insight into the way ancient Egyptian architecture and art works, but it says something about this was the way Seti I and Ramses II chose to decorate their mansions of millions of years. They wanted to pay full, you know, homage to the great kings of the past. And place themselves within that yes, list. The si- yes, exactly. Yeah. They're okay. part of the list. Interesting. Uh, he, Ramses, we have, we have him down, don't we, as you know, you got a sort of um, the, a classic great man of history, really mm. quite violent, quite, quite build, violent, like building. What, yeah. what do we what do we know about him? Um, much less than we would like to. Okay. Um, he tells us a lot about one particular um, military endeavor, the Battle of Kadesh. Yes. So I, it, I listened to an in our time about Kadesh the other day. Oh, okay. And I came away thinking. We don't know if it's a battle. We don't know who won. We don't know who lost. Yes. We don't know if it happened. I'm like, ah, oh, it's one of those ones, isn't it? It's tricky. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you even get this, the same with Hatship. So she, she sends this expedition off to Punt. But we know there are earlier kings who have re- records on the temple walls of expeditions to Punt. So to what extent is that a historical reality? And oh. to what extent is it just, just something to please just... the gods? Oh, God. Okay. So it could be fake, fake news in that oh. sense. Um, so... <sighs> The, w- the account Ramses gives of himself standing alone essentially in the battlefield because his other soldiers have deserted him is in some ways, for a god king, quite human. Mm. And so it's plausible. Okay. It seems like a plausible story. I- I'm also not sure that boasting about how all of your own men abandoned you and <laughs> ran no. away is quite the flex you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could, you could be shitting yourself in the foot there yeah. because that's eternal... Yeah. Um, you're just a, you're just a bad leader. Yeah. yeah. Like okay. So so there's so, a, and and that's in what it, up towards Lebanon. Where where is Kadesh from? Yeah. Me? Up to it to, to what we would call the Levant. The Levant. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon. Okay. Syria. Uh, and so there's military expeditions going on. Uh, is Egypt under threat? Are these expeditions against sort of existential enemies, or are they raiding expeds? Is he just aggrandizing his own? There's some sense, <clears throat> perhaps, in which. The great kind of victories of Tutmose III, for example, Hatshepsut's stepson, nephew, have the, the kind of frontiers have receded with time. So Akhenaten doesn't seem so interested in, although he still has keeps up pretty strong diplomatic correspondence with, with different neighbours. So there's a sense in which the, I hate to call it the empire, but the, the sphere of Egyptian influence has, yeah. has shrunk. Okay. And so Ramses has to re-establish it. I don't think it's a direct threat to Egypt itself. It's Egypt's vassal states yeah. that are threatened. Yeah. So Egypt has to make a bit of a noise um, to, to reassert its importance. 
Um, what about wives? I mean, he he rules for a very long time, right? Sixty-six years, which is very long in the ancient world. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's long any time, mm. frankly. And he uh, has many, many wives, or, or many productive partners, or how you call them. <laughs> many productive yeah, yeah. partners. Uh, he has at. It depends how you count them, uh, but he has around a hundred children. And in some ways, it's sad he outlives twelve, mm. at least twelve of his sons. So he's only um, succeeded by his thirteenth son, lucky for some, uh, a guy called Merenptah, who comes to the throne pretty old, maybe in his sixties or even seventies. And it's a mm, little bit of a Charles the Third situation where you have to mark, make your mark in history after a long-lived um, parent. Um, and I think Ramesses the Third was being worshipped already as a god, as a full-blown god. And if you reach your 90s in the ancient world and you see your children, your wives, your grandchildren dying around you, that's not very pleasant. No. Um, and maybe to some extent, you know, the, the court, such as it was, the people who surrounded him in the palace, maybe thought, gosh, this guy's never going to die. Maybe he is really a god. Oh, interesting. You know? Yeah. He he gets called that. He, he gets called... Ramesses pa nature, Ramesses the god. Yeah, but guys, we say that we say that about everyone, but maybe this guy really is mm, a god. Really, yeah. it's like poor Louis the well, not poor Louis, Louis the Fourteenth buried his son, grandson, great grandson. So I imagine and similarly difficult for his successors. So we've got um, and, and amongst those wives, Nefertari. You go you everywhere you go in Egypt, you see her name. What's going on there? Um, I think this uh, largely arises from the confusion with the name Nefertiti. Who was oh, the wife, so? of course, of yeah, of Akhenaten? Oh, People okay. get confused. So Nefertari is the lady who Ramesses builds a temple, a kind of his and hers temple, set up at Abu Simbel. So right in the south of Egypt, uh, south of Aswan. Oh, I've never been there. I'd love to go. And that is worth a visit. Oh. Um, uh, just on the the shores of Lake Nasser. So you have the big famous looks like an Iron Maiden album cover yeah. <laughs> uh, front frontage of Ramesses in the rocks four statues of him but he is being worshipped there as a god himself it's like a, a divine avatar of himself he bases his kind of PR program a little bit on Amenhotep III so he uses him as a role model for sure but then he takes along Nefertari as the wife goddess and this is something that seems to again hark back to Amenhotep the Third and Queen T, the grandparents of Tutankhamun, and it you do get the sense that he's genuinely in love with Nefertari, and the other women are maybe he's less fond of secondary because he marries, of course, diplomatic brides from foreign kings, and it's said, of course, no daughter of a king of Egypt will marry a foreign prince, but as part of a peace treaty, the pharaoh will marry. Any right. foreign princess. So you can bring them in, but you can't export. No. No. Okay. What else do we know about him? Um, he himself, we've got his body. Oh, yes, so we do, don't we? Yeah. We have the mummified body. And it's interesting, it was found in a cache uh, of, of lots of royal um, personalities. And amongst that group, the best coffin is reserved for... All the coffins are reused, but Ramses II really has the nicest. So even when they've taken his body out of his tomb to, 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 for safekeeping? Yeah. Because it's in another, it was in another tomb in the Valley of the Kings, wasn't it? It was moved around. It was yeah, like musical okay. chairs. Yeah. Uh, so as the, as, everything, as, as the wheels are falling off at some stage in, later, uh, the, the valley is what presumably be threatened. Yeah. They're, they're moving some of the best people. They're sort of trying to hide people like Ramesses. So even those later people are sort of, even within the cache, even within that yeah. kind of rescue mission, they're like, oh, obviously give Ramesses second the nicest tomb. Ah, okay, that's really he, 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 Yes, he, get, he gets the nicest coffin. And it's interesting that the... The stripping of the gold <laughs> um, is not just a fear of robbers, it's the state itself funding current military yes, expeditions. Yes. No, we should, sorry, we should, yeah, the good point. So it, it's not necessarily um, bandits from outside, no. it's the states melting down the valuables, yeah. Or we're doing this, you know, out of this great sense of piety for great kings of the past, we're also just pocketing all the gold yeah. that we've found in the process of doing the rewrapping. Right. Exactly. Um, but Ramesses II, as a, um, as a personality, of course, is closely associated with uh, Bible story about the Exodus. Uh, it was often thought that he was the pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, Is there any truth? Well, it's uh, difficult to, to say, to be honest. Some will say um, it's Ramesses II uh, still. Is, do we know about the historicity of Jewish people in Egypt at the time? 
Um, there are attestations, of course, of of of, of Jewish um, settlements in Egypt, yeah. and there are other historical echoes with groups like the Hyksos, who we know, you know, were expelled oh, we're from expelled. Egypt. Okay. Yeah. So there may be a folk memory there that does relate to the Exodus uh, narrative. But I think Ramses the Second, in a way, gets a bad press because he seems to be artistically a bit slapdash. You know the jury's out on on the Battle of uh, Kadesh, and he's is painted as a bit of a a tyrant. We don't know that. We don't know either way. But and there's no evidence that he mistreated a group of Jews who then tra- not traveled. definitively. No, no. no, but I don't know really honestly what that evidence would look like in the archaeological no. uh, record. Yeah. The word Israel appears for the first time in the reign of his son. So you know the concept of groups with biblical names is is happening yeah. uh, uh, around that time. He has, though, I should say, my favourite thing about Ramses II is not him himself, but um, he's great. He has a son, his fourth son, who in the list of the great sons in the temples, when they're shown, all the sons are shown with kind of military apparel, and the fourth son is, is shown with a big bunch of flowers. And uh, this is a guy called Chaim Wasit, and he is often called the first Egyptian Egyptologist hmm. because he goes around excavating ah. and restoring the pyramids. So he does it ostensibly in the name of his dad. So he puts the name of Ramses II on the casing stones of pyramids, which, remember, originally were blank. So you can imagine a situation, reign of Ramses II, and Ramesses put his name on everything, every available space, every old statue gets updated with his facial style and his name so you could imagine wandering along maybe going hunting in the desert and seeing this massive expanse of stone and thinking that's an area I could be putting my own name on yeah. isn't that funny lost great, opportunity here. the kings of the past yeah lost the opportunity to aggrandise themselves so there's a sense of uh, Prince Kamwaset going around researching the past labelling the pyramids and then he himself is something of a culture hero by the Ptolemaic period um, he features in one of the first ever ghost stories from well one of the best ghost stories we have uh, of ancient uh, from ancient Egypt of a reanimated mummy so the the whole story of the mummy and the the Hollywood uh, stories oh, filtered through kind of gothic horror comes from the character of this scholar prince who goes in search of this lost knowledge in a tomb and the spirits of the dead come and haunt him. And so Ramesses II, we're not the only ones fascinated with him. I mean, he no. was, yeah, his legacy was hugely powerful in, in the years following his death. Yeah, yeah so, so later kings name themselves after him. He's worshipped as a, as a god. Um, there's a whole priesthood operating into the Ptolemaic period. Really? So a thousand years after his death. That's pretty impressive. Which is pretty impressive. In modern times, you know, his his reception, whether it's, you know, Yul Brynner in um, The Ten Commandments or Shelley, Percy Shelley writing Ozymandias, that is based on a colossal sculpture yes. of Ramses II. And it's interesting, yeah, King of Kings is actually a divine title of Ramses II, Heka in Hekau, ruler of rulers. Wow. So it's a funny historical echo of the greatness of Ramesses. So by the New Kingdom, you've got 2,000 years now mm-hmm. stretching back yeah. to the pyramids being built. Yes. Slightly less, but they, they'd already been looted. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They've yeah. been got into. Right. Yeah. And so building-wise, Abu Simbel famous mm-hmm. Ramesseum. Ramesseum, his mansion of millions of years. That's what that's what he called his man, what mansion of millionaires. What because his his spirit will live there. He'll yeah, go and be worshipped there. And 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 that's that's true of most kings of the the new kingdom. To be fair, Ramesses was just following in a tradition, and it's funny that um, a, a later king, Ramesses the third, builds an almost total carbon copy of the Ramesseum, which itself you've been, haven't you, um, to to West Bank Thebes? It's not well preserved, no. but we know of the decoration scheme because of the oh, later king making such a close copy. I mean, even the later king names his children after the names of the children of Ramses II. Is the landscape littered with temples? 
I mean, it, um, as you like Abu Simbel, the various mansions of a million years. Mm-hmm. I mean, just just littering the banks, the Niles, it, well, it, along in certain places. Yeah. Um, so again, Ramses gets a little bit of a bad reputation for recycling okay. on such a big scale. Now, bearing in mind he's got sixty six years, and he definitely exploits quarries for um, extracting new building material. There is something very deeply meaningful about putting the name of the current king on the statue of an ancient king because no kings look like the faces of the statues. They're timeless, generic images of, of, of godliness. So Ramesses adding his name onto the sculpture of one of his predecessors is a way of just kind of tapping into that ancient sense of kingship. And although we might be quite dismissive of it, oh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, Ram, just wants to put his name everywhere. I think it's more, he's more sensitive than that. And it's interesting at the Great Sphinx. So the Great Sphinx is over a thousand years old by the time Ramses comes along. That is something like, and I hate to draw a spurious comparison, it's sort of like a Westminster Abbey. It's the place you go. I'm not saying the ancient Egyptians performed coronations as we might understand them, but it's a way, it's a place you go to have the sense of history confer and confirm your kingship. So between the paws of the Sphinx, Ramesses Mm. II, very early on when he takes the throne, sets up this little room of him worshipping the Sphinx. And it's almost like the Sphinx, or the god incarnate of the Sphinx, says to every new king, right, you are okay, you can be the pharaoh of Egypt. And that just, you talking about that makes me think why we all have heard of Ramesses II, because he had decades and decades and decades, put his mm. name on everything. So if Egyptologists in the 19th century, every time you look anywhere, you see Ramesses' yeah. cartouche. Yeah. Usar you, Matra, Setep Enra, Ramesses II. Boom. It's, it's on, and it's one of those, those little symbols. You, you, you've just, you're always stumbling. At, and, and I guess it took people a while to then... Initially, in the nice century, they must have thought Ramsey literally did build everything. Yes. They, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think there was it was only <laughs> when Egyptology maybe became a little more critical that they realised hey, some of those names are later kings copying oh the name goodness. of Ramses II. Okay. And then, yes, Ramses uh, II himself putting his name on older structures and, and sculptures. And so he is, fa- he is important... Uh, instantly after his death, uh, as, a, yeah. as as a as somebody to aspire, as a rep, sort of reputation to aspire to and emulate. Mm-hmm. Um, and does that remain? I mean, do the Romans know about Ramesses? Do do medieval kings in Europe? Do, do the Arabs? I, I think in 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 you know popular accounts that were uh, uh, collected by you know the time of Herodotus or or Manetho. So Manetho is this great. Um, Egyptian priest historian who kind of legitimizes the early Ptolemies. Okay. So he's trying to collect Egyptian history. But like I said, you can go to an Egyptian temple and as long as you can read hieroglyphs, there are lists of kings. So Manetho, reading, being able to read hieroglyphs, would of course have known who Ramesses II right. was. So there's one thing, there's the documentary evidence that's passed down, and of course that can be corrupted, and then there's the folk tales that talk about this great king who did battles up yeah. and down the land. And those endured? Those endured, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, Champollion, the French decipherer who cracked the code um, using the Rosetta Stone uh, for, for that established this, this kind of Western idea of, of, of control of Egyptology, that sense of being able to read the name of Ramesses II, you know, you get that, that, that feeling of him just going around and for the first time in so long reading the name again and again and again and again and again. And And so for him, he must have thought, gosh, this Ramesses, Usar Matra, Setep Enra, must have been really quite the the big cheese. Uh, Grand fromage. Speaking of Grand fromage, (laughs) Ramesses would be absolutely livid now if he'd been (laughs) knocked into second place of most famous pharaohs by the teenage Wonderboy. Well, yes. Because of the because of the tomb found in the um, found a hundred years ago, right? Yes. Carmen is now the most famous. Yes, that's the more household name. Yeah. Sure. Um, that's a question. You know, you know, Tutankhamun's tomb is relatively small, um, and I've often wondered. It seems in the case of Tutankhamun, which is really the only intact tomb we have from the New Kingdom, that any clothing that touched his body was sacred and yeah. was kept. So and his underwear lots was of kept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you wonder, were there rooms... 65 years. Yeah, in the tomb of Ramses II that was just his wardrobe. Well, and it's big enough, right? It's pretty big. Sadly, very badly damaged. Yeah. Not nearly as, as well preserved as his father's, say to the first. But you do wonder... There seems a sense maybe of of superstition about, OK, we don't want to finish the tomb because if it's finished the king will die and we'll have to yeah. use it. So it, it kind of constantly gets expanded. That's so it's it's sizable. Right. Very sizable. And, and yet unfinished. It's a strange... It's strange. Just it's, for someone that rules for that long, like you'd thought you'd get your tomb sorted. I suspect his son starts working on the son's tomb as, as Ramesses gets on in oh, years. Yeah. I think that's what's happening, really. Okay. Campbell Price... Thank you so much for coming My on. Pleasure. Everyone should go to the Manchester Museum, shouldn't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. We're free. Uh, we've nearly had a million visitors um, almost a year since reopening. It's a phenomenon, yeah. Yeah. Come on down. Definitely. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.